hold on to your butt. <laughs> oh, hello. Welcome to episode 88 of the Civil War Breakfast Club podcast. Oh, and thanks for listening. As always, I'm joined by Mary, a woman who is celebrating Canada Day this weekend by dressing up in her Canadian tuxedo and bathing in a, a tub full of Tim Hortons coffee. Oh. <laughs> I am I am merely a faded uh, maple leaf named Darren. How are you, Mary? Oh or should I say, bonjour, Mary? <laughs> so you think you can speak both official languages now that you've been in my country for a weekend? I cross the border. I can speak the language immediately. Immediately. Shocking. So that's how good I am. We'll it see how you do when we go to Montreal sometime. Oh, definitely, definitely. So what's <laughs> going on? What's what's new with you? Not much. We're back to recording after not recording for a few weeks. We took a little bit of a break there. So, but we're back tonight to not to steal your thunder. You're you're the host, but we are going to be talking the Tullahoma campaign. Oh, that's it. That's exactly what we're doing. But since I am a fantastic host, I will ask you this question, of course, which is, what are you drinking tonight? I am drinking Good Monster uh, IPA by Collective Arts out of Hamilton, Ontario, and I'm drinking it out of my Joseph E. Johnson mug because he is going to get a little bit of a mention in our first part of the Tullahoma campaign, which we're recording tonight. I've heard of him. Okay. And what um, are you drinking? Oh, thanks for asking, Mary. I am drinking, it's called Double Jitsu. It's from Bayfield, Baywoods? No, Bayfield? Bellwoods. Bellwoods. That was one of the first. <laughs> Bellwoods. Okay. It's from Bellwoods uh, it's in a beer, Toronto. <laughs> it's a beer in Canada. And I'm drinking out of my Mary Surratt mug because today is the day of the execution. Say what you will about that whole thing. I have a mug and today I'm going to use it. So that's that. So we can get rolling with this. This is going to be the beginning of a two-parter. It we're is. going to talk about Tullahoma. We're going to talk about the first part of it. And then next week, we're going to go back to an action-packed episode and finish things thing up. So I just got to set the two just just yeah. real time, okay? It's early July and the, the the eyes of Civil War's nations, the lonely eyes have turned to Vicksburg and Gettysburg, yep. as they say, right? We're going to talk about that red-headed stepchild, of course, which is this time of year, which is the Tullahoma campaign. Mm -hmm. Now, despite being completely overshadowed by the other events happening at the same time in July of 1863, this brilliant campaign by William Rosecrans against Braxton Bragg's army is right up there with U.S. Grant's Vicksburg campaign is one of the all-time greatest in military history when you really think about it. It is, and it only the, the Tullahoma campaign compared to something like Vicksburg, especially Vicksburg, but also Gettysburg, it only lasts about 11 days. There's really only one major battle in it, Battle of Hoover's Gap, which we're going to be talking about in this episode. But it goes back to what Rosecrans' plan was and how it factors into driving Bragg away from where he is and eventually securing this the city of Chattanooga, which ultimately, of course, this campaign does not, they don't secure Chattanooga. But this is kind of making their way. They They've got Stones River, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes about what happened there. They have to get Chattanooga. Um, they're trying to drive Bragg out of like Middle Tennessee. But then after that, the ultimate goal is going to be Atlanta, which is going to be in 1864. But that's what this is. It's, you know, it's this brilliant campaign. Not a lot of battles, not a lot of like, you know, there's no pickets charged, anything like that. But it is up there with Vicksburg and Gettysburg. It is. And what this campaign really did is it shined a bright light on Rosecrans mm -hmm. and the Union. Uh, on the Confederate side, you know, that this 10, 11 day campaign really highlighted the deep uh, distrust and hatred within the Confederate army towards their commander, Braxton Bragg. And, and that has been simmering really since they evacuated the dance floor in Kentucky, right? Yeah. And I just don't mean the rank and file soldiers. I mean the generals. Now, you know, just after the Battle of Stones River in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, in early January 1863, Bragg is going to pull his beaten army out of the area, and they're going to go about 30 miles south along the Duck River to kind of rest and, and relax and reform, right? Now, although his army needed rest, Bragg knew he still had to protect that city of Chattanooga you talked about, yep. which was that strategic, it was strategic due to a bunch of reasons. It had railroad junctions, it was a gateway to Georgia. Um, you know, there was a whole bunch of things, and he favored Rosecrans's army, even though he knew they were probably pretty battered too. He knew that they'd be coming eventually for Chattanooga, so he's going to have to prepare for it. Now, Rosecrans, like I mentioned, you know, he did want Chattanooga, but he also knew he needed to rest his army at the mm -hmm. Cumberland, yeah. which, like I said, was beaten up after Stones River as well. Yeah. So he's going to hang around Murfreesboro for about six months. He's going to be chilling there to give his men time to just recharge, you know, their batteries. And Rosecrans insisted. And he has a quote, he says that he organized an adequate cavalry force to combat that of the enemy, which he considered vastly superior, you know, the Confederate uh, yep. Conf uh, cavalry. He also wanted to establish, you know, and secure a really a good depot of supplies before he moved out of Murfreesboro. So he wanted to be prepared. So to that end, 
you know, he's going to beg Washington for better cavalry resources. Yep. And of course, Washington says no. Now, you're going to remember, too, their eyes are focused on Lee coming into Pennsylvania as well as, you know, Grant primarily going through, you know, going to Vicksburg yep. at this point, right? Although the lead thing hadn't really happened yet, but Vicksburg probably no. was really taking up a lot of their time. You know, it's kind of like Pawn Stars. Lincoln goes, well, the best I can do is this. He says Ooh. no, but he's going to say, I tell you what you can do. I'll give you the okay if you want to outfit an infantry brigade as a mounted unit, right? It, yeah. And so, uh, the thing is, is this goes back to like February and it shows there's a lot of miscommunication going on here too. Like February 17th, 1863, Lincoln writes to Rosecrans that he's concerned about the menace that is the Confederate cavalry, which Rosecrans at this point is like, that's what I've been talking about the entire time. And Lincoln is like, you should do counter raids. Lincoln writes him, what think you of trying to get such a core in your army? Could you do it without any or many additional troops which we have not to give you provided we furnish horses suitable arms and other appointments please con consider this not as an order but as a suggestion march 20th 1863 rosecrans writes to halleck where his troops are positioned and he ends off the correspondence with we are pushing forward supplies to nashville but from the unfrequency of convoys and want of transports we are somewhat delayed our want here is cavalry so he's constantly going on about this you know needing cavalry and like you said you know they basically say to him you can go ahead and do what you want and halleck tells us to rosecrans on march 21st 1863 he says no restriction is placed on your mounting infantry and cavalry arms and equipments are sent to you as fast as they can be procured but it is believed that you weaken your force by mounting too many mounted infantry are neither good infantry nor good cavalry that is when we have wilder enter the dance floor right and he is basically like hold my beer well I can that do letter this. that he from halleck literally ended with and the horse you rode in on it that's did. the funny thing about it yeah and so you know rosecrans is in a situation where he's like well you know he's going to end up you know, it's a wilder he's going to end up taking a brigade from joseph reynolds division okay yeah. from that 14th corps and 1,500 men from the 17th and 72nd Indiana, as well as the 123rd and 98th Illinois, and place them in that, in that mounted infantry brigade under that man you mentioned, Colonel, commanded by John T. Wilder. Mm -hmm. So he's going to have an opportunity here, as they say, to want to take care of this. And the one downside is they have to find their own horses and get their own mules. Yeah. So it's like, congratulations, you're in the, you're in the NASCAR race tomorrow, but go find your own freaking get your car. Own car. That's, the, that's the scenario. We're talking 1,500 guys. They just don't go down to the horse store or the mule store. I mean, you got to think about how that was, but the amazing thing about it, guess what they do? They do it. Yeah, that and that's what Halleck basically says to him. Like he says, Rosecrans has full authority to seize horses in the enemy territory, but he can't seize horses in the northern states. Halleck says the law regulates the purchase of horses and every possible possibly authority has been given to the quartermaster of your army and of the Western Depot to purchase animals for you. But it's basically like we can't give you that many. But if you want to like ransack them from the southern countryside, go ahead. So what had happened is Wilder discovered, you know, around the time of Stones River, he's trying to go pursue John Hunt Morgan. We just did an episode about um, I've heard of him. And they're on mules. And He's another Ohio lover. He is. Big time. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> um, anyway, Wilder and his men are on mules during this when they're trying to pursue Morgan. And the problem with mules is they're not very quick. He requests to mount his entire brigade with horses. Wilder ends up putting this idea of being a mounted mounted infantry to a vote for his men the 75th indiana did not want to be mounted infantry so they leave and they bring in 123rd illinois to take its place in wilder's brigade you have the 17th indiana the 72nd indiana the 98th illinois 123rd illinois and the 18th indiana battery which is co commanded by colonel eli Lilly and also known as Lilly's gunners and these men gather horses from around the countryside and a few and they have to take a few mules, even though they aren't considered the best. Now, the thing with John T. Wilder is he's well-respected among his men. He was not a stretched, prim, polished commander, not a made commander, but a born one. And although his career with his brigade, he showed the gain, t gain tenacity, the elasticity, the supreme handiwork of unspoiled nature. He won the confidence of the entire brigade without an effort, and the men, they could do whatever Wilder ordered. And his modesty equaled his merit. He never boasted. He was willing to be judged by his chips. He was active. He hated the monotony of camp life, and his brigade was early imbued with the same idea. 
So all these men have the same idea. And that's what we're going to see in this Tullahoma campaign with them is they just like go out there and, and they do it. And again, later it shows at the Battle of Chickamauga. These men had originally been outfitted with Springfield and Enfield rifles. And then Wilder was like, yeah, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to get them Spencer repeaters. This allowed Wilder's men to lay down a tremendous amount of fire that could be delivered at a high rate of speed. And Wilder loved the Spencers. And the Spencers are a new thing at this time. They're a relatively new technology. Um, so the Spencer magazine rifle was the most formidable re weapon. And Wilder said, I believe them to be the best arm for the army use that I have seen. No line of men who came within 50 yards of another force armed with the Spencer repeating rifles can get can either get away alive or reach them with a charge. As in either case, they are certain to be destroyed by the terrible fire poured from the ranks by cool men thus armed. If the government would expand the large sums now used to induce men to enlist in arming the men now in the field with this kind of weapon, the rebellion would be, in my opinion, speedily crushed. And that's what Wilder had to say about it. But at the time, when Wilder suggested that he arm his men with Spencers, Washington was like, hell no, we're not doing that. So what does he do? He goes to the bank and he gets a bunch of money. He gets a loan and he outfits his entire brigade. And what he does to pay him back, the men just give him some of his some of their pay each time they get paid. But eventually, Washington realizes how useful these weapons are, and they pay Wilder back for them. Now, the other challenge that Wilder faces with having mounted infantry is this is not something that's commonly done. So he has to develop his own tactics for it, but he uses, he still uses Hardy's tactics, but he develops them for mounted infantry. So they nearly always fight dismounted, single line with men at intervals of six feet since they had the Spencers, and they always tried to get close to their opponents because then they would have the benefit of rapid fire and they usually waited until they were within 300 yards to even fire, and they did not believe in long-range fighting. Wilder said, My command had little time for drill, as we were kept close to the enemy, and our movements were mostly firing in range of our opponents, and that I found to be the most useful drill we could have. And Wilder and his men are going to be kind of like the MVPs of the Tullahoma campaign with what they do. But this is where Rosecrans finally gets what he wants, is with this mounted infantry of John T. Wilder and what would become known as the Lightning Brigade. All right. Well, you know, Wilder, he, he gets those guns, very reminiscent of Nathan Bedford Forrest on the Confederate side. He uses his own money a lot of this case. He does get paid back. And so he's got that crack unit. Now, the other thing that Rosecrans, that, you know, he's sitting on his butt there, but the other thing that's, that's holding him back is the weather. And this is going to be a nonstop mm -hmm. issue throughout this campaign is the weather's really bad. And the roads, it's not exactly the I-95 we're talking about here. We're talking country roads to the mountains. That's going to be muddy and crappy. Yeah. Now, so the, in the winter of early spring, and moving this army, we're talking 60,000 or so people through Tennessee had to have been a miserable task, despite the back in Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Edwin Stance, and Henry Halleck, you know, they're pulling their hairs out and yep. wanting to know why the hell you're just sitting there staring at each other, you know, and not moving, toward, moving towards Chattanooga. Now, the concerns from Washington were valid, though, right? Because though considering that U.S. Grant was in the middle of his assault in Vicksburg, mm -hmm. and, and, a, and a, if, Bragg, if Bragg knew that Rosecrans wasn't coming, what was the big fear? The big fear is he would take some of his army of Tennessee and shift them up towards Vicksburg to yeah. help out Pemberton and Joseph Johnston over there who were trying to hold on to Vicksburg. So they're sitting there going, okay, Rosecrans, here's the deal. The longer you're taking, the more they're going to move men. And then we got a whole new set of frigging problems, right? Lincoln about this is going to mention Rosecrans and he's going to say to him, this quote from old Abe, the guy with the hat, Mary, <laughs> I will not push you to any rashness. I, I, but I'm very anxious that you do your utmost short of rashness to keep Bragg away from getting lost to keep Johnston against Grant. Two things to take away with that. Johnston, had, Lincoln had a rash. He it twice, okay? <laughs> He's afraid so much, not a Bragg, but of that army of Pemberton getting stronger to really, because Vicksburg, like he said, was the key he had to have in his pocket, yeah. right? Now, Bragg, he had his own set of problems after oh, Stone's River, Oh, right? my God. This no. is very dramatic, no. and I know you've got a lot of stuff on this. Well, not, I mean, not too, too much, but, but you know, like Rosecrans, he needs to refurbish his army of Tennessee. Yep. He's going to have 40 or so thousand guys, so he rests, rested behind a series of rocky hills centered around the town of Tullahoma, mm -hmm. Tennessee, okay? Now, he extends his line about 50 miles from Shelbyville, Tennessee, in the west, up to McMinnville, which is in the east. But he's spread thin. Now, the terrain is brutal. 
Um, in his army, they had to defend three mountain gaps that Rosecrans would have to use to get through this, these mountains. One is the Belt Buckle Gap, one is the Liberty Gap, and one is Hoover's Gap. I got a feeling I'm going to be hearing about that one a little bit later mm-hmm. on, Mary. Just, just to guess. The Rebs are going to build entrenchments to defend these narrow gaps, but they had limited guys. And the guys who were defending, they were mostly cavalry. Now, Rosecrans was kind of afraid of these guys, but there still wasn't too, too many. When these armies were basically in their places, Rosecrans and army basically spent the next months, the next six months just preparing, okay? Because they knew they were going to go. Now, that I mentioned before the terrain, the area around Tullahoma was referred to by Urban Buck. Now, he's Patrick Claiborne's aide, man. Yeah. You know, you've heard of him. He called Tull- Tullahoma a godforsaken place, okay? Yes. Which is in the middle of nowhere. The rain and snow uh, turned those narrow roads into complete quagmires of mud. One of William Hardy's aides famously named the town the two Greek words, Tulla meaning mud and Hola meaning mud. Yeah. They talk about that. And you can imagine, you think about the mud march. This is kind of what that was. That's what I thought I, of when I was thinking, when I was looking at this. And the other area they refer to it as, as the barrens because it's such poor farmland and it made it difficult for them to get food. Yet the ironic thing about this is they are protecting the railway for food to move from Chattanooga into to Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. Yet mm-hmm. Bragg's men are the ones that are starving. Yeah, it goes to show how that is. You know, yeah. but, you know, and while the Rebs are sitting in this muddy wasteland, okay, they stewed in, in, in there was this nonstop, constant anger towards their commander Braxton Bragg, okay? Like if you're sitting around and you got nothing to do and people are going to complain, they're always going to complain about the boss, but they got reason to. Yeah. Many found Bragg to be completely incompetent. He was cold. He was inflexible. He basically alienated himself from his core and the rest of it. He was just a miserable prick is what he was. Yeah. Now, he had some medical issues, but he was that guy. So he was the guy who would give out pennies on Halloween. That's who he was. Okay. Not or, a nice guy, Mary. Or Not raisins. Nice Sorry to or people raisins. who like raisins, but okay. raisins are the worst. This kind of, I don't want to call it a, it's not a mutiny, but it's nearly that at this time is like it goes back to Perryville this is something Mm -hmm. that men like you know William J. Hardy and Leonidas Polk are carrying with them now mind you Polk is a guy who's kind of his own problem too like I mean he takes orders just as it's like oh these are guidelines they're not orders I don't have to follow them because I'm Polk many push for Bragg to be removed they yep. mostly did, okay? Mm-hmm. But he had a good friend named Jefferson Davis who kind of remained supportive of him. Now, the animosity towards Bragg dominated the minds of the Army of Tennessee's commanders while they were sitting in the mud, knowing that Bragg had, had once again handed the initiative away in the region to the Federals again, right? He had a habit of getting there and then backing off, getting mm-hmm. there and backing off. January 27th, we're going to go a little bit ahead here. We're going to go a little backtrack here, you know, going back and forth. But January 27th, 1863, Joseph Johnson is going to visit and saw the state of Bragg's army. Now, many Rebs were thrilled to see him. Well, kind of funny how, how later on people thought about Joseph Johnson. Yep. He walked in like he was Santa Claus because you know why? <laughs> Because they, they thought, thought he was, he was take com- over. coming to take over, right? So here, oh, here, here we go. We got ourselves a guy. Now, Johnson is going to agree the morale of the army sucked, but he felt that Bragg kind of performed pretty well at Murfreesboro. And he wrote to Davis, he writes, it would be very unfortunate to remove him at this juncture when he has just earned, if not won, the gratitude of our country. Okay. That's what he says, right? Wow. Okay, well, right? With this newfound support. You know, Bra- you know what Bragg's going to do? He's going to start walking around with his chest puffed out now. He's going to submit his official battle report or Battle of Stones River, okay? I know we're not talking Stones River, but I'm going to digress here. He used that battle report to criticize and take a warming beer piss all over his subordinates, oh, okay? big time. Include- because he, he used it to get against the guys who he hated. Yep. He spoke well of William Hardy, though, okay? He spoke well of Claiborne. Patrick Claiborne, and he spoke well of Leonidas Pope, of all people. He bashed Benjamin Cheatham for being drunk. He bashed John Breckenridge for being lazy and slow. I know this sounds like your performance report at the DQ last year, but we'll, we'll just, just I don't want to bring up bad memories, okay? But especially John McCown, who he arrested for getting lost and exposing Claiborne's left flank during the battle. Needless to say, the officers he mentioned negatively were not exactly thrilled with this, right? Now, in response, Leonidas Polk is going to write his own battle report. He's going to write his, his, his own version, which contradicts a lot of what Bragg said. And he complimented Cheatham's performance, of all things, 
which led Bragg to think that Cheatham and Polk were in cahoots to get rid of him. So he's like, oh, he's contradicting me. He must want to get me. Is this when so he this... writes the do you like me circle yes or no? So he, he, he so he's going to do his own poll. But this is like Survivor. <laughs> Who's going to be left? Who's going to be left standing in Palo Homo in this exile world? That's what this is. Confe- Confederate Army Survivor? Braxton, you're off the island. <laughs> that would be amazing. Grab gra- gra- your boiled ass and get on your mule and roll out of here. You're gone. Aww. Right? But but at this point, you know, Braggs does something that's kind of a head scratcher for whatever reason. He's going to write to Polk subordinates and ask them to what extent you sustain the general, Polk, and his general's and, and, and his general disobedience. Basically, he's asking Polk's guys to throw Polk out of the bus. Yeah, He wants him to, 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 to basically dispute what Polk said. William Hardy, he's a peer of Polk, as a corps commander. He got wind uh, of this, and he advised Patrick Claiborne in the great Sterling A.M. Wood, it must have been early in the morning, Ooh. to basically to ignore the simmering feud with Bragg that continued throughout the spring into the summer, okay? This is kind of the atmosphere, the personalities as we head into this campaign, okay? The weather did warm in the spring and the mood did lighten up a little bit, okay? There's that great story of Patrick Claiborne and two of his aides rode out and stripped down and they're all together and swam at a place yep. called Ovaca Falls and, you know... And the boss goes, hey, you want to get naked swimming? What are you supposed to say to that? So you do it. Is that when he happened. rode back? He couldn't get his socks back on because they got wet. So he had to ride back so barefoot. He, he, like... One boot on, one boot on. Some, yeah. some silly thing. But um, William Hart, and this is, you know, all these stories. William Hardy was, was many times hanging with Patrick Claiborne, who was very shy. Yeah. And he's, uh, Claiborne was, I mean, Hardy was kind of a flirt who loved the, the lovely oh, ladies yeah, this of a one. place called Beechwood Plantation. And there was that one time when Hardy and Claiborne met, met a few young women along the way while rioting. And Claiborne was embarrassed because he had some dirty uniform with like a, like he'd been rolling around in the sewage tank all day. <laughs> and he's going to, he's going to ride back to change. Now Hardy is going to return to camp and he's looking for his wild Irish general. That's what he called. And Claiborne's in his tent bitching about how Hardy he always has to changed. talk to the ladies. And so, and so Hardy says, you know, he says to him, is it not proper for a subordinate officer invited to ride with his commander to come properly dressed and not be frightened home by the sight of a couple of ladies? It was kind of a joke. And, that's kind of how it was. So it was lightened up, but there was definitely an animosity towards Bragg. On the Union side, the warming weather brought more pressure from Lincoln on Rosecrans. To desperate, he desperately wanted to move yep. against Bragg. He wanted to brag out of Tennessee primarily because he wanted those men away from Johnston and Pemberton in Mississippi. So yeah, as Grant's success at Vicksburg becomes more and more apparent, as you said, like they don't want more troops to be confederate troops to be drawn to vicksburg because that was what happened at stones river right like that's why bragg loses stones river because he's down a division right because one of the divisions got drawn to vicksburg like and and during this time too like prior to the tullahoma campaign there's been some reconnaissance activity some skirmishing between union and confederates but it's it's not much it, it's basically like everybody's to winter quarters and they're sorting out their own dramas in each army is, is happening. And that's when Rosecrans comes up with this plan, which is going to become the Tullahoma campaign. He's finally going to get rolling. He's yep. finally get going. It's, he figures it's time to move. Okay. So Tullahoma campaign basically begins slowly and not aggressively. Now, What's amazing about Tullahoma, as we'll talk about this, is it's very devoid of battles. Mm-hmm. It just is. Yep. It's going to start when he assigns a reserve corps under General Gordon Granger to leave Murfreesboro in March on a town of Triune. Now, here's we're gonna, in a nutshell, we'll talk about this plan. His plan is diversion. It's smoke and mirrors, okay? This move is nothing more by Granger to just basically big demonstration designed to confuse Bragg, which sounds like didn't take a lot. And it spent, he spent the last six months anxiously awaiting Rosecrans to come. He knew he was coming and was just waiting. Yeah. Granger is going to move south, is going to move towards a town called Shelbyville, which is on Bragg's right, okay, with the hopes that the rebel general will basically fix his entire attention there. He's actually on Bragg's left, not Bragg's yeah. right. So he's going to basically try to – he sees them coming. In Granger, he's going to move his men like he's marching in the Rose Bowl parade. He's making as much noise as he can. He's got the, the brasses. He's got the goems. He's got the girl with little twirly things. He's got everything, right? He's got pinwheels. Because he, he wants to make as much noise as he can. Hey, look at us. Here we come. Woo-hoo, yep. We're coming. 
on the morning of June 23rd, Union Cavalry under David Stanley is going to start moving southeast on the Lewisburg Pike from Triune towards Shelbyville with the plan to push back any like any rebel resistance at nearby Eagleville, Unionville, Middleton, and Rover. Small little towns along that, that range, okay? This is all happening to confuse Bragg. Now, Gra uh, Grainer's infantry is moving southwest from Trion to Salem to give the impression that a major attack is being planned at Shelbyville on mm -hmm. Bragg's left flank, okay? Predictably, this sets off all the alarms in Tullahoma. Yeah. And Rosecrans' de Rosecrans deception could not have worked better if he, you say, literally plans it out, but that's exactly what they did. Rebel cavalry under Joseph Warchild Wheeler, okay, is going to see this and report to Bragg that a major attack is imminent in Shelbyville. Wheeler was ordered basically to guard the eastern end of the line, Bragg's right, not the western one where Granger was coming. So Wheeler decides that he's going to move his entire cavalry across that Confederate line from right to left towards Shelbyville. What this is going to do, it's going to leave that eastern end of the line guarded by a single cavalry brigade under John Wharton, okay? who is supposed to screen the whole rebel line east of a place called that Liberty Gap, that second gap. So what this means to so the cavalry that Bragg wanted on his right, that early warning signal is now basically pretty much gone. Mm -hmm. So the deception's working because you guess what? Guess where Rosecrans is going to go? He's going to go where there's not as many men. He, hey, right. I didn't know we had a West Pointer in the house. Yeah. But the state, when, state, when Stanley's cavalry approaches <laughs> Shelbyville, just outside of Eagleville, they're going to start to bump into some rebel cavalry uh, who knew they were coming because they, they were, like I said before, they were not exactly being stealthy here. Okay, it's not you sneaking in on a Friday night back from there drinking little bats over in, you know, to Goddard behind them under the, the football stance of Goddard. I hear Mary. They're making as much noise as they possibly okay. can. We're talking the seven, uh, the seventh, the fifty-first Alabama cavalry as well as the 2nd and 4th Georgia, okay? They're going to fight those approaching Rebs for about two hours. That's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And they're going to, but those Rebs are going to be driven back by the 9th PA in the 2nd Michigan. So they're going to get pushed back pretty good. That next day, the Union Cavalry is going to continue to push towards the town of Middleton, yep. where they continue to drive off skirmishers, including sharpshooters, perched in those town, bu the town buildings in the town. Now, after pushing them back, they're going to fall all the way back to a town called Christiana. And this is going to be really where, the, where the meeting point is going to be with the coming yep. infantry. So they're all going to set up at a certain point to get there. And while this is going on, they're pushing back this rebel cavalry. But what they have is now they have Bragg's attention focused 100% on his left at this point because yeah. he's convinced, convinced that's where they're coming. The next phase of Rosecrans' plan is, is really launched the next morning on the 24th, yep. okay? This is when Alexander McCook's 20th Corps is going to begin to march from Murfreesboro headed towards Liberty Gap, okay? This is the next gap leading to, to Hollahoma. We, mm -hmm. we talk about those gaps, right? Right. It's six o'clock in the morning, okay? Colonel Luther Bradley, his brigade is going to march south on the Shelbyville Pike to secure a set of crossroads that lead to that town of Christiana. Now, this brigade was called the All Illinois Brigade. Guess why? Because they're all from Illinois. They're all from Illinois, okay? 22nd, 27th, 51st, and 42nd. Although they did have five companies from the Mountain Brigade in the 39th Indiana, so not really close, but that's what they were called. Yeah. They're going to engage the Confederate pick a line just outside of Murfreesboro at a place called the Knob. There you go with that, yeah. okay? And I mention this only because guess who was there fighting the Confederates? Our old friend Phil Sheridan. Yeah. The, the king yep, of the king of the there. valley, maybe. Yep, that he was, there. he was there fighting with that. So you can kind of see how this is starting to go now. So by 8 o'clock in the morning, that next wave of Union artillery uh, infantry is going to start. They're all going to leave Murfreesboro. This is time it's going to be uh, August Willich's 1st Brigade from the 20th Corps. This is Richard Johnson's division now. Mm -hmm. They'll be led again by mounted infantry from that 39th Indiana we mentioned under Thomas Harrison, right? Guess what they're armed with, Mary? Spencer. There's a Spencer repeaters yep. too, right? Yep. And they're going to overwhelm that first and third Kentucky so fast. Uh, they were A lot of these guys were, these Kentucky guys were in the fields cutting wheat when they got caught. Yep. They ran right through them. But McCook got good intel from these guys, from these wheat cutters, look like to call them, okay? Who told them there were only two rebel regiments that were in this, in the gap. So he ordered Willage to move forward and, and get it. So while the attention's on that Confederate left, 
the Union attack is starting on the center in the right now. Mm -hmm. When Willich got there, he deployed the 15th and 49th Ohio across the road. This is leading into into Hoover, is what this is doing, okay? And they're going to survey that terrain. Now, when he he saw the rebels were defending a steep, rocky hill in a strong position, and there was no way they could possibly attack them straight on, so he decided to extend his line by putting the 32nd Indiana on his left and the 39th Indiana and those Harrison guys on his right. I mentioned before that those weak-cutting prisoners mentioned it was two regiments, okay? The two regiments that they talked about were good ones with a 5th Arkansas and the combined 13th and 15th Arkansas under St. John Liddell's uh, brigade Mm -hmm. under Patrick Claiborne's division, Hardy's Corps, okay? The Union men did have greater numbers, and they did eventually, and that did eventually tell the story, and it did push the Arkans, Arkansans, Arkansanians. What do you, what do you say there? Arkansans. Arkansans. Okay, you don't say that word too often. <laughs> Basically, back to t- to take that Liberty Gap. We'll talk more about Liberty Gap later on. Okay, but Claiborne did trust that that Liberty Gap to Liddell, thinking if they was going to be attacked. They could certainly hold a long enough to let Claiborne bring up reinforcements, which did which did not happen. And this is when that, that lightning fast Union uh, attack came and drove Liddell out towards Liberty Gap. Now Claiborne, you know, Claiborne is sitting at his headquarters in that near at the town of Wartrace. He found this is going on just around dark. This is all going yep. on. You know, the next morning, you know, maybe this one we're going to jump around here a little bit. But the next morning, Claiborne is going to try to retake it by reinforcing Liddell with three regiments from Sterling A.M. Woods Brigade. But they didn't attack, you know, they didn't attack the pass full on here. And, and, they, they, and they didn't even really advance his men. What Claiborne decides to do is he's going to use his sharpshooters here. Now, they were armed with Whitworths. And yeah. you know, if you know, you started Claiborne, you know how much he loves sharpshooters. Oh okay? yeah, he loves them, especially after Shiloh when he realizes he's like, shit. If I had have sharpshooters, I might have been able to make more ground on that second day. He's start picking these guys off. Now Claiborne's thinking he could hold the feds in place until Leonidas Polk arrives, right? Mm. Now this plan is going to fizzle when Claiborne gets a message from his boss, William Hardy, who told him to fall back as a large enemy force just blew right by Alexander Stewart's division, who was stationed just east of the next pass, which is called Hoover's Gap, yeah. okay? So just kind of moving geography right across. Now, again, remember, to the weather, it's pouring, okay? It sucks out, okay? Claiborne's pissed because he, again, is told he has to retreat. If you study Claiborne, you know that his story is whenever he gets in a situation, he's going to move forward. He always has kind of told he has to stop. Yeah, That's kind of, and this is going to happen again. It's a It's a constant theme. One of Claiborne's men writes in his diary after this latest retreat at Liberty Gap. Oh God, must we leave our homes and our loved ones to the mercy of the ruthless foe again, too, without an effort to prevent it? Now, many of these Rebs were retreating in the rain. They're wearing no shoes. Many got lost in the mud. Mm -hmm. They had no dry clothes. And this added to the resentment towards Bragg, which is a constant theme who felt his men retreated too often. That same soldier who talked about the defending our homes, he's going to write, one thing is certain, if Bragg cannot whip Rosecrans, he can certainly outrun him. Yep. So it's kind of funny how that goes. And this is going to lead towards Hoover's Gap. Okay, now the move towards Hoover's Gap that Hardy described was George Thomas's 14th Corps, led by his 4th Division under Joseph Reynolds. Mm-hmm. Um, and and. I know we want to, we're going to talk about this whole situation, but leading his way is his famous mounted hatchet brigade under yep. the aforementioned John Wilder. Yep. Colonel John T. Wilder is leading these men. This is the major battle, the Tullahoma campaign, and it's actually... If any, any of you live in the area, it's just off Interstate 24. So this area is formed by a range of hills that run westward from the Cumberland Mountains and the Pike ran for two miles through the hills. The valley is barely wide enough to admit the passage of two wagons side by side. So it's really narrow. It's hard to get through. And as Darren said, Colonel Wilder is here with his brigade of mountain infantry. And they're called the Hatchet Brigade at this time. They're not yet called the Lightning Brigade. And well, they got the, you know what they were called that? Because they carried hatchets with them. They called hatchets. Because yeah. they, they when they had to get their own weapons, they've got hatchets. Yep. Which is it, pretty it, cool. Yeah. Exactly. The new sabers, they had hatchets, which is pretty bad. Hatchets. hatchets, pretty badass. I'm going to start walking around the bars with a hatchet. Oh, my See God. See how that works out. Yeah. <laughs> the thing with this, and and you mentioned this, Darren, like the weather, it's raining. So it's drizzling when they leave for Hoover's Gap, and it will rain all day. Colonel James Conley, who has excellent firsthand account of this, which just 
Google Colonel James Conley Hoover's Gap. It's a really great account. He said, on the morning of June 24th at 3 a.m., we left camp five miles north of Murfreesboro and started to the front in advance of everything. So they are going out ahead of the army. And he said, there was silence in the column as we moved along through the mud and every ear was strained to catch the sound of the first gun of our advance guard that would tell us of the presence of the enemy. So they're constantly listening for something. They, they think that Bragg must be there. And Wilder knew that Bate was defending the top of the gap. However, they find the summit unoccupied. Conley says, as we swept through the valley with 1,500 horsemen on gallop, we noticed the lines of entrenchments crowning the hills. They were deserted. The enemy was surprised and flying before us. So like Bragg's men have been like, oh shit, we need to leave. Like we have to get out of here. Wilder, all of a sudden he's under orders to retreat. But despite this, he decides to try and hold the gap. And Wilder entrenches in the hills south of the gap. He's determined to hold the position that is very advanced of where the infantry are that can support him. So if he gets in a mess, the infantry are too far back that they can't come up and rescue him. So noon on June 24th, the first gun is fired. And Conley says, we pushed ahead rapidly for we were nearing the formidable Hoover's Gap, which was supposed to cost a great many lives to pass through. And our brigade commander determined to surprise the enemy if possible by rapid march and make a bold dash through the gap and hold it with our brigade along with the rest of the army until the rest of the army could get up. So Conley even saying, we have to hold this place. And again, the Confederate cavalry have been so surprised that they just like, they vacate the dance floor so quickly. Conley describes them as going through the woods and over the hills in every direction, every fellow for himself. That's exactly how it was. It was mass chaos when they leave. And there is just one lone Confederate cavalry to hold this gap. And these are the guys that are quickly pushed out of it. What stops Wilder's men initially Initially is a shell explodes near them. This tells them that they've finally reached the, where the artillery and the infantry are. So they finally reached to where these men have run back to. And this is the point that Wilder is like, okay, I'm not going to retreat. I'm just going to stay here and hold this. They are 12 miles in advance of the army and they had taken a point which it was expected would requ would require a large part of the army to take this is what conley says uh -huh. and conley goes on to say but the serious question with us now was could we alone hold it in the presence of a superior force well wilder learns uh, that there's just being confronted with four brigades of infantry and four batteries and he's kind of like all right i'm just gonna do this so wilder will have his men dismount they will form a battle line the entrance to hoover's gap and lily's gunners are going to come in and just open on the confederates wilder dispatches a courier to the rear in order to hurry up the enforcements like you guys need to get up with us and the horses they draw them back out of the way the bursting shells because just remember these are not a lot of these horses have just been procured you know from the southern they've taken them from farms and stuff some of them have been shipped from the north but if they lose their horses that's it like they they can't lose any of these horses the confederates are describing um opening a terrific fire of shot and shell from five different points and their masses of infantry with flags flying moved out of the woods and on our right in splendid style that so conley's describing them as suddenly attacking them meanwhile as all this is going on it's raining and the wilder and his men are outnumbered three or four times are, are what's attacking them and the confederates come at them and wilder's men fire their spencers the advancing regiment reeled and its colors fell to the ground but in an instant their colors are back up again and on they come thinking to reach the battery before our guns can be reloaded but they reckoned with their host they didn't know we had spencers and their charging yell was answered by a terrible volley and another and another without cessation until the poor regiment was literally cut to pieces and but few men of that 20th tennessee that attempted the charge will never charge again. And that's what Colonel James Conley, he just, like, he just describes them. They cut down these men of the 20th Tennessee that are charging them. Um, oh, it's the speed. I mean, that's the thing about yeah, them. Yeah, it's like, you can, I think they said, like, you could fire on a Sunday and fire a, or something like that. Like, you, you just keep going. And the thing is, these men covet their Spencers. They, because, you know, they've, they've been paid back for them. But beginning, you know, every rifle, every man was going to pay for. You paid for your own rifle, so you're going to covet it. You also know the Confederates do not have these access to these Spencers yet. This is like, this is a Union re weapon that they have. Connolly talks about, you know, one corporal in the 17th Indiana was shot through the chest. And these men, because they coveted them so much, they would sooner break their weapons if they were wounded than risk the Confederates coming in to take them. Oh. So this one guy who was shot through the chest, he didn't have the strength to break it. So he took out his knife. He unscrewed a part of the lock plate that would just basically make the, the gun useless, threw it away, and then he fell back and died. But before he died, he rendered the Spencer 
completely yeah. useless Bas- because he did not, it, you, know? you know, and that's one of these human stories that is coming out of this, you know, this battle of Hoover's Gap that is just these men are fighting hard. You know, what is helping them is now we're seeing how the technology of warfare, as horrific as this is, the technology of warfare is why Wilder, despite the fact he's outnumbered, you know, you know, however many men, he's able to do this and hold this. You had those five companies led by Sam Kirkpatrick, that's that 72nd yep. Indiana, right? They ran right through that first picket line. Yeah. Hazardous too. Went right through it. Okay. And, and just just imagine that, you know, the last thing they probably expected was to see these guys coming so quick and they moved so fast. You know, those rebel defenders didn't have time to set up even a defensive line. No. They ran they ran away so fast that oh Howard would blush. That's how fast they moved. Hey. Okay? They, they left behind seven wagons. They left behind regimental flags, a bunch of empty DQ blizzard cups, <laughs> all kinds of trash. They just left and ran, right? You know, the thing is, it happened so fast, the rebel commanders didn't even know that it even happened until mm. after the fact, right? So figure one o'clock back at his headquarters, our old friend Bushrod Johnson married, okay? Yeah. He's, sit, he's sitting there, and he, he fierce hears of this assault when a pair of local riffraff boys, some urchins, they come running into his camp and tell him what happened. Guess what we just saw, right? What happens? Now that you have men from the 1st and 3rd Kentucky, they're going to corroborate this story that, that they just got overran. Bushrod immediately is going to text General answer Alexander Stewart in his phone. He's going to say, uh, he's going to he's going to forward the message to William Bates saying, hey, um, you, have a, you have a brigade nearby. You might want to send them over to Hoover's Gap because it's Freaking bunch of guys just ran through here. Bay is going to quickly set up those guys. And this is what's going on behind the scenes on the Confederate mm-hmm. side. That 20 of Tennessee mentioned, the 37 Georgia, the Ufala Light uh, Artillery. They're at the village of Beach Grove, where the plantation was, where, where old William Hardy was getting his swerve on, Mary. Okay. <laughs> and they're near Hoover's Gap, and, and as well as some sharpshooters from Georgia under Theodore Caswell. Now, Bay figures this is the most logical place here is to stop this Union advance, like you mentioned. They had to stop Wilder first. And, and this is the thing about him, though, is they had some initial luck against him, this 20th Tennessee and yep. this 37th Georgia. Okay. Now, Wilder was a fella who liked to fight Mary, as oh, you yeah. know. And in order to fall back, he pulled up his old F this car. Yep. He wasn't having it. No, nope. right? he's like, nope, we're doing this. He's gonna play, he's gonna place two companies of a 98th Illinois along a road, along with the 72nd Indiana near a graveyard, okay? Supported by a pair of howitzers and six 10-pound Rodman guns, okay? So he's coming to fight on the center of this hill, supported by the 123rd Illinois and the 17th Indiana, okay? Mm-hmm. Now Wilder's men had no support. They outraced their coverage. Don't forget, they were so fast. They were a full six miles ahead of the infantry. Yeah, but these guys are like badass. And and Lily's gunners are they they're starting to earn themselves a reputation, you know, in the army of the Cumberland as being like these badasses that can just like they annihilate the Confederates. You know, Lily's mm-hmm. guys are really amazing. But you're wilder now, and you you know you've got your guys, you've got the Spencers, but they they don't they're not long range weapons. You you know you've got some guns, but you know you've got no support. And he's being told to fall. He's going to be told to fall back now. Yep. In front of in front of Williams Bait, the Confederate side, his he has his full brigade and he has two batteries of artillery, which are going to begin firing on Wilder's guns. They're quickly going to take out two gunners. They're going to take out a bunch of mules. Bait is going to then send them that 20th Tennessee. In those Caswell sharpshooters in to try to flank the 17th Indiana. Now, what is Wilder going to do? He's going to send to the 98th Illinois, yeah. which were his reserves. Now he's in his reserves. Now he's going to the he's going into the deep in the pocket. Yeah. Now they attack the Rebs, who are just about on the verge of turning his position. And what this is going to result is a brutal firefight within a hundred yards of each other firing right into their friggin' faces, okay? The Rebs fall to the ground. They literally, literally crawl back to the woods, okay? A messenger now arrives. He tells Wilder, you need to fall back. You need to friggin' fall back. And Wilder says, you know what? Nope. Nope. He keeps going. Like Conley says, he just, he keeps going. And, you know, Conley's account of this is one of like, it's an amazing account. I encourage anybody to go read it. Mm -hmm. You know what's cool about Wilder with this messenger? He says, I'm not, I'm not going back. You need to go back and you need to tell them. I said, 
I'm not doing it. Yeah. Balls. Okay. Oh, it big just time. Is, okay? Yeah. This is, um, and this is set like, you know, this is setting up for what he is going to do at Chickamauga in September that he is, this is the battle that is kind of, he's been thrown to the fire. I mean, his men have done things before, but this is his, like, he's proof. You know, you have to look back to what Halleck said that mounted infantry are basically useless. And Wilder has just done, this is his hold my beer moment right here is Hooper's Gap with what well, Halleck said about them. You know, hold my beer. At some point, Bate's going to realize I got mountain infantry yeah. here. I'm going to keep going. So Bate is going to try again. This time he's going to go straight at those six at those six gun batteries he was going to go at using his 20th Tennessee and 37 Georgia again. These guys have been taking a beating at this point. I mean, this is, yeah. you know, just bad. And they're going to charge in with fields and they're going to run right into the 123rd Illinois who have been hit. They were hiding in a ravine. So this gets worse and worse for them. You know, when the Southerners approached, they rose up this 123rd and just boom, 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 just laid them out. Wilder said of this specific part of the battle, he says, no human being could successfully face the avalanche of this destruction. That was a quote he said. Now, this is going to force the Rebs to basically fall back, and they're they're done. Bates guys took that beating, they lost an estimated 25% of the brigade. They went down trying to trying to retake Hoover's Gap. They'll mercifully be replaced by Bushrod Johnson's Tennessees, who are going to get in the field right yep. around 6 p.m. or so. Wilder finally is going to get a little bit of a break here. So for his efforts, he's going to get relieved when George Crook's brigade arrives. They're going to show up. Despite giving the finger to the orders and openly defying his orders, he's going to get high fives from everybody in that army command. And I know Thomas is going to say some pretty cool things about him. He does. And it's funny. So Wilder sees Rosecrans and Thomas riding up. And I don't know, like Thomas is kind of like the ER. <laughs> the, he's ER. <laughs> Of the uh, mm -hmm. the army at this point, I don't know if that makes Rosecrans like Piglet right now. <laughs> I just picture Piglet New York coming up. <laughs> Why I thought of that anyway. So Wilder thinks he's gonna catch shit for disobeying orders. He tells Rosecrans he knew. He's like, yeah, I, I know what I did, but it was for good reason. And Rosecrans says, thank God for your decision. It would have cost two thousand lives to have taken this position if you had given it up. He turns to Reynolds and he says, Wilder has done right. Promote him. So Wilder's gonna get promoted and then thomas said to wilder you have saved a thousand men by your gallant conduct today i didn't expect to get this gap for three days wilder has held his own here and the other thing that is going to happen because of what happens at hoover's gap is his men are going to get the name of the lightning brigade they were called the hatchet brigade it was yeah. kind of derogatory so we were carrying the hatches we talked about and because of how fast they moved yeah. There's going to be an official pronouncement. This isn't just a nickname. They'd be mm. officially known from this point on as the Lightning Brigade. Yep. So at this point of the battle, the Union is going to control the gaps. Okay. And we're going to talk in, the, in our next action packed episode of how Bragg is going to react to this. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not going to surprise you, Mary, that at this point of the battle, Bragg has no idea what's going on. No, he, he doesn't, doesn't. Even know this. He doesn't know this stuff is going on in his right. He thinks the battle is still coming on his left and he's waiting for it. And he's going to find out that he's going to find out the hard way. So I think we should drop this episode here yep. and set up the rest of it. Okay. So when we go back to the boys, they're going to be set up the union more than men in blue. We're going to be sitting on the gaps waiting for the next order from Rosecrans, who's so far has sprung this perfect campaign to get to Tullahoma and so far so good. So we'll see how it turns out yep. next time. So I know when I ask you this question, what's coming up next? I kind of know the answer to this one. So next Wednesday, July the 13th, we are having our roundtable at 6 o'clock Eastern time via Zoom. Info at CivilWarBreakfastClub.com if you've never attended. I'm going to be sending out, or I should say, we're going to be sending out invites this weekend for that. So You are coming. <laughs> hope you can join us for that. Our Facebook <laughs> Live, if you're listening to this on Saturday morning, is going to be at 10 o'clock, obviously on Facebook. So hope you can join us. Uh, next week's episode, obviously Tallahoma Part 2. And then after that, we will let you know. We are still in the planning stages. We are planning possibly to take a few weeks off in August just because we have a lot going on. It doesn't seem like we're that close, but I mean, episode 88, Episode 100 is on the horizon for us, so we are trying to plan something special for episode 100 um, and as well our book club. We hopefully will be announcing a date for that soon to talk uh, George Mead at Gettysburg, uh, Kent Masters right. of the Ground. Amazing book. So some strange foot, strange things afoot at the Circle K, Mary, as we go off into our episode. So 88 is in the books, off to yeah. 89. 89, it will be the second half 
of the Tullahoma campaign, where we'll see if Rosecrans and his Army of the Cumberland can take the Army of Tennessee led by the great Braxton Bragg. Can he do it? Can he do it? We'll find out soon. All right. So off we go. Any final words from you, Finchero? Well, thank you for being an amazing co-host, as you always are, and bringing it every single time. And thanks to our listeners for your support these last 88 episodes. It has Mm -hmm. been amazing. And same to you and the horse you rode in on. (gasps) There we go. (laughs) What did I do to you? (laughs) What, did I give you a bad blizzard at the DQ? It's all good. It's all good. Blizzard spilled out and it didn't (gasps) stick in there, but it's okay. All right. Maybe if you weren't such a bastard customer... Okay, well, okay, on that note, okay. I was going to wave my Canadian flag, but I guess I'm not going to now. You're Canadian, an honorary Canadian. Canadian now. You've had well, Tim Hortons. Well, Canada is over, so time to move on. Okay. All right, everybody, thanks for listening. We appreciate it. So off to part two of Telehome. We'll record that one next week, and off we go. Hope to see you at the round table. Hope to see you at our live. And maybe, Mary, hope to see you with a smile on your face once in a while coming up oh. soon. So we will, we will find out. God, we'll find out. All right, guys, we appreciate it. We'll talk to you soon. Have a great, uh, have a great rest of the week. Hope you have a good weekend. Hope it stays, it's cool where you are. And um, stay safe. See you guys later. Peace the hell out. Okay, bye. Do, 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 do.